Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you in the name of God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a joy to gather with you today for yet another time of worship together as family and faith. We uh, have a special welcome to those listening to us over the WFLO airwaves and also to our friends who might be joining us on the Facebook live stream. Uh, greetings and welcome to you all. It is a joy to gather together. And as we prepare to move forward in our time of worship, I certainly would invite you to reflect and review the uh, inserts. We have several inserts going on with the beginning of October before us. We have the birthday list, of course, for October. And um, we have a few names on here that... Uh, I don't know. I see. I see some of you all out here on the list. Um, Elizabeth, I didn't know you were Halloweeny. Okay, all kinds of fun coming up. Your birthdays. Thank God for birthdays. Uh, there's also a an insert about the telephone ministry. And uh, if you want to help with that, we do need volunteers and, of course, good announcement, good information there. It's not hard to do. You just got to be regular. Uh, there is also an insert on the special offering for next Sunday, the um, Peace and Global Witness offering. We're going to take that next Sunday with World Communion Sunday. So... Um, if you would like to participate in that offering, information about that. And I have one other thing. Well, just one other. Christian education and nominating committees are both meeting next Sunday after worship. And, of course, next Saturday at 11, we have the memorial service for Catherine Wilk. Um, so you all, and I know you all are aware of that and um, are looking forward to that time together. 
Also, you will notice that we have a Bible study coming up in October. The Mondays, uh, I think it's 11, 18, and 25. Um, it's, I'm calling it the brown bag Bible study because we're just going to get together and bring a lunch and we'll have some Bible study. Nothing too, too serious necessarily, uh, just some good conversation and engagement over scripture together as people of faith. We'll just kind of see where it goes. And um, of course, you are welcome to bring those pressing questions that you might have. Uh, we're going to see how it works. We're going to start with these three sessions and just see where it goes. Also, I wanted to just highlight again, we have a bunch of boxes out here in the fellowship hall behind us that need uh, some love, and you are welcome to do it. Just a reminder, we have our packing party coming up. It's not till November, but I have a feeling that November may be here before we know it. Uh, who knows? We'll see. But um, so November 9 at 10, 10, uh, 10 o'clock will be our packing party. Uh, just want to remind you all about the Operation Christmas Child Shoeboxes and have fun. Okay. Any other announcements of which we need to be aware? Friends, well, let's rejoice then in the gift of this day and the opportunity to share in God's grace as children of God in this time. Join with me in our call to worship in the bulletin, friends. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. The law of the Lord is perfect. Reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Let us pray. Holy and almighty God, we rejoice in the gift of this day, this time, this, this very moment in which we are able to invest ourselves in your glory and to receive from you your glory. Make this holy space your space, O oh God, and lift up our hearts, our voices, our spirits in yours, that whatever we do here, we may proclaim the grace of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first ten friends, come Christians, join to sing 267. Uh, follow along in your hearts, appreciate the music and sing um, with your inner voice.
hard not to like that one. Brothers and sisters, it is also an opportunity now as we move into and through our time of worship together to recognize that we are serious here in that we understand that the world is a difficult place and we all have a part in it. This difficulty, this brokenness, even sinfulness itself is a part of all of our lives. Even though it does not own us, it is ever present. Let us recognize this fact and seek to be uh, reminded and healed in God's mercy yet again. Join with me in our prayer of confession, friends. Let us rise and speak our need for God's help. Thank you, O oh God, for hearing us, despite our weak and foolish voices. Our tongues betray our comfort with sin and falsehood. Thank you for hearing us, despite our weak and foolish spirits. Our apathy toward injustice betrays our disregard for the hurting. Thank you for hearing us, despite our slow hands and feet. Our excuses betray our small investment in your great kingdom. Yes, O oh God, you listen to our hurting hearts and our earnest pleas. Make us better children, better disciples, better neighbors. Make us more willing, more able, more enthusiastic, more honest, and more loving as your people this day. In the name of Christ we pray. Amen. Truly, it is a good thing to be honest before God. It's a good thing to be honest in God's love and to know that God honestly loves us in return. Let us celebrate this with our assurance of pardon in the bulletin, friends. The risen one has conquered death and gives us eternal life to enjoy the fullness of God, our Holy Father, to whom be the honor and glory. Amen. this day, we come before you and ask that you speak to us, speak to us in our thinking, in our speaking, speak to us in our praying, speak to us in our inward singing, speak to us in all in our offering, and speak to us in all of the ways, oh God, that you can speak. But speak to us profoundly through your word. Open our hearts and lives before you in this special time of inviting your voice. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. All right, friends, our first lesson is from 1 Kings chapter 11, and we're setting a new stage here. We're going to see Solomon, uh, Solomon's ending his life uh, we're at the end of his life, rather, um, and so we're having new characters pop up, uh, Jeroboam and Rehoboam. Everyone gets them confused, uh, but uh, first we're going to meet Jeroboam and see how God plans to use him. So, 1 Kings chapter 11, beginning of verse 26 Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, 
an Ephraimite of Zerida, a servant of Solomon, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow, rebelled against the king. That's King Solomon. The following was the reason he rebelled against the king. Solomon built the Milo and closed up the gap in the wall of the city of his father David. The man Jeroboam was very able, and when Solomon saw that the young man was industrious, he gave him charge over all the forced labor, i.e. slaves, of the house of Joseph. About that time when Jeroboam was leaving Jerusalem, the prophet Ahijah, the Shilonite, found him on the road. Ahijah had clothed himself with a new garment. The two of them were alone in the open country when Ahijah laid hold of the new garment he was wearing and tore it into 12 pieces. He then said to Jeroboam, take for yourself 10 pieces. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, see, I'm about to tear the kingdom from the hand of Solomon and will give it and will give you 10 pieces tribes. <clears throat> Skipping to verse 37. I will take you and you shall reign over all that your soul desires. You shall be king over Israel. If you will listen to all that I command you, walk in my ways and do what is right in my sight by keeping my statutes and my commandments as David my servant did, I will be with you and I will build you an enduring house as I built for David, and I will give Israel to you. For this reason, I will punish the descendants of David, but not forever. Solomon sought, therefore, to kill Jeroboam, but Jeroboam promptly fled to Egypt, to King Shishak of Egypt, and remained in Egypt until the death of Solomon. The word of the Lord, my friends.
I'm now turning to 1 Kings 12 to continue the story here. We've looked at Jeroboam, and now we're going to consider Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. Now, you heard the ominous prophecy that the kingdom is about to be torn apart. Has not happened yet. Okay, it's about to happen. And Rehoboam has to make a bad choice. Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had come to Shechem to make him king. When Jeroboam, son of Nebat, heard of it, for he was still in Egypt where he had fled from King Solomon, then Jeroboam returned from Egypt. And they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all the assembly of Israel came and said to Rehoboam, your father, made our yoke heavy. Now, therefore, lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke that he placed on us, and we will serve you. He said to them, Go away for three days, and then come back to me. So the people went away. He considered the matter. Verse 12. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king had said, come to me again on the third day. The king answered the people harshly. He disregarded the advice of the older men that given him and spoke to him according to the advice of the young men. My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. So the king did not listen to the people because it was a turn of affairs brought about by the Lord that he might fulfill his word, which the Lord had spoken by a high to the Shilonite, to Jeroboam, son of Nebat. And yes. And then all Israel saw that the king would not listen to them. The people answered the king, What share do we have in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel, look now to your own house, O David. So Israel went away to their tents. But Rehoboam reigned over the Israelites who were living in the towns of Judah. When King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was taskmaster over the forced labor, all Israel stoned him to death. King Rehoboam then hurriedly mounted his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. When all Israel heard that Jeroboam had returned, they sent and called him to the assembly and made him king over all Israel. There was no one who followed the house of David except the tribe of Judah alone. And one more, just because you were worried I might not be reading enough. Flipping over to the Gospels, Matthew chapter 10. This interesting and even troubling passage has Jesus sharing with us, do not think that I've come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I've come to set a man against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and one's foes would, will be the members of his own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. In case you're wondering about that scorpion business a minute ago in um, 
from Rehoboam's threat, they're not actually going to throw scorpions at anybody, but there was a whip that was worse than a regular whip because it had a little hook at the end and they called those whips scorpions. Yeah, not nice. Okay, okay friends, buckle your seatbelts. I want you to tell me what's wrong with this picture. You're one of 12 children, nice big family. Some of you actually might be the one of 12. Um, but let's say you're one of 12 children, and all of you grow up, and you go on to have your own families. You all stay in touch and live near each other, and your families get bigger and bigger over the generations. After a good long while, you have lots of people in your families, loads of cousins. One day, however, one of the families, let's say, the family from sibling number four says that it is the best one at living the way mom and dad intended. So they get to make the decisions for the entire family going forward. They will act like the parent now for all the rest of the larger family. If you're thinking like I am, that might not end well. But wait, there's more. They don't even do a good job being in charge for very long, but they still say that everyone must listen to and follow them. How do you think this family is going to rate on the happy family scale? If you are wondering, whether this family is going to survive, that is a good question. Of course, if all of this were actually happening today, they would get their own reality TV show and make lots of money. But the truth of this story is that it's a very old one. It's actually the story of the first civil war. If you are astute, and I know you all are, you will have picked up on what I just did with that story. My illustration was a rough comparison with the people of Israel, the 12 tribes that came together as one nation under David, but did not really last long, only 73 years, once David became king. Yes, it was loosely a nation under Saul, but lots of people thought David was actually the king anyway, basically, and God had rejected Saul as king. Then that nation divided again for seven years after Saul died. What we really think of as the true united kingdom of Israel, its strong days under David and Solomon, was actually less than the average lifespan today. So if you're older than 73, and I won't make you raise your hand, if you're older than 73, you've outlived the nation of Israel under David and Solomon. I find that pretty staggering. Now here's the thing. Once they quit being a united nation, things got ugly. They even went to war with each other from time to time. Immediately after the passage that I read today, Rehoboam, Solomon's son and the king of Judah, tries to go to war to force the northern tribes back into the nation. God said no, however. And that really is a puzzle to me. We might think that God would want the people of Israel to work it out, stay together, and find a way to go forward as one covenant people, but that doesn't seem to be the issue at all. In fact, it reads as if God's idea, this was God's idea and plan to begin with. The reality is a bit murkier. The 12 tribes were really never all that united. 
It didn't take much to separate them from being one nation or to divide them as a people. We know they were really only together for a brief period in their history. Nevertheless, God seems to be fine with their separation. A nation literally ripped apart as Ahijah tore his new garment. This rebellion, this stoked rebellion among people who were not happy to begin with ushered in a time of change that the people had never seen. The stability of the kingdom was at an end. The Israelites, who were most oppressed by Solomon's slavery, were now free to determine their own path. Jeroboam in the north had a huge task ahead of him in creating a new nation. Change, change, change was everywhere. Of course, life is kind of like that. Hundreds and hundreds of years later in that same land was the arrival of Jesus. And the greatest change that the world has ever received. Even though the average person might not have perceived that change that arrived with the presence of Jesus, many, many people did see a difference and felt the new ways that were going to be. Jesus' teaching, his miracles, his exorcisms all pointed to this radical change called the kingdom of God. No longer were people bound to human or earthly kingdoms. The new kingdom that superseded all of them was the kingdom of God, of course, also known as the kingdom of heaven. Here's the thing. What happens when big times of change come over us? We might remember those moments as, you know, as we stepped out on our own or began a new phase of life or had to figure out a new birth or how to live without someone. Maybe it was a new job or just the changing world in which we live like today. When life changes or we change or both, we have to figure out how to adapt and what to do with new ways of living and doing because one of the things that happens is that our priorities and our commitments also change. A move, a new responsibility, a new relationship, or new life that depends on you or a shocking loss, all affect what's important to us. That's natural, that's necessary. We can't just assume that we'll all be the same or feel the same when things are moving around us. That's what the people of Judah and Israel had to wrestle with and that's what Jesus is pointing us to. That passage in Matthew is strange and shocking and doesn't sound a whole lot like Jesus. We would just assume that Jesus wants us to be good families and uphold our relationships, but what he sounds like is the opposite. Like he wants to divide families. Well, he actually doesn't. He's not actually calling us to divide families, but he is trying to make sure that we have our priorities straight in the change that comes from meeting him as Lord. Yes, just meeting the Christ is another change time, a pretty significant one. When we become followers of Jesus, it is for keeps. He's the only Lord, and He's the one. And He is, and that is what He wants us to realize. 
There's no relationship that comes before our relationship with Jesus. Unless we come back to that realization again and again, we run the risk of forgetting and having our priorities off. It does happen. People get their priorities out of whack all the time. Case in point, Marcin Molas Muchalski. Yes, I did not do that right, but Marcin Muchalski. Who back in April of 2004, true story, had his priorities challenged. He was pedaling his way to New York in, in, on, the, on a bicycle when a mugger came out threatening him, demanding his valuables. Well, all he had, he didn't have any valuable in his backpack. The mugger said, give me your cell phone. Well, Mar you know, Marson, who had no money, nothing else, was like, uh-uh, you're not getting my cell phone. He also was in a big hurry to get to work on his bicycle. He refused to hand it over. After all, that 38 caliber handgun that the mugger was holding didn't look to him like a real gun. And he certainly didn't think the mugger would actually shoot him for a handgun or for a cell phone until the mugger shot him in the leg. You might think at that point, you give the cell phone. But no, not Marson. The robber put the gun to his arm and shot again. At this time, Marson decides to run away with his cell phone. He's you know, hobbling, oddly, zigzagging back and forth because he's been shot twice. And he's hoping that the mugger doesn't shoot him in the back. Um, but the guy, thankfully, the mugger decided it wasn't worth the trouble and he just ran away. Well, Marson got to safety and called the police because he had his cell phone. Uh, they did catch the guy. Hmm. Maybe slightly messed up priorities. I don't know. I'm guessing. Yes. I won't even tell you about the woman who ran into her burning house to rescue her season tickets to the Philadelphia Phillies and nothing else, and then learned that they could have just been reprinted if they were destroyed. Fact one, people have all kinds of priorities and commitments, and some of which are kind of bad. Fact two, we do not often consider our commitments or priorities, especially in times of change, when they must also change whether we realize it or not. We don't think about it that often. Fact three, as followers of Jesus, we cannot just assume our priorities are, or commitments are correct just because we do churchy things. In fact, we can get into real trouble assuming that we are okay the way we are and don't need to check our priorities because we are proper church members. This very fact that church people can become smug or complacent means that we're even more risk of having wrong commitments or priorities. They might sound or look good, but they could well be more self-serving than God-serving. In the time of extreme division that followed the death of Solomon, his son Rehoboam became king of the southern kingdom of Judah and Jeroboam became king of the northern kingdom of Israel. There's no one guilt or blame for this, but it became a fiasco of every person for himself. Neither nation survived. One did come back and reform, but they forgot what was important to God and rarely bothered to think about what was truly important to them as children of God. More than anything else, 
what we need today are godly priorities that will guard life, the dignity of all life, and preserve the good that is in all people. No one is really the enemy here. Even those whom we identify as the enemy are those who deserve our love too. I was speaking to a gentleman yesterday who was greatly vexed about how he was living a mile away from 6,000 Afghani refugees with nothing between them except for woods. He was truly nervous, but also confident that if they did not come waving the American flag and singing Amazing Grace, they were going to meet his guns. This is one priority that we hear and see these days. It just doesn't sound like Jesus' priority, though. We can't love anyone more than him. And he said to love our neighbor as ourselves, period. That's been the law since the beginning. God's law, Jesus' law, his new commandment is to love one another as he has loved us. Our changes may push us into some kind of new civil war. I pray not, but I do know that we'd all better check what's important to us and whether it is important and what is important to us measures up to what is important to Jesus. We are about God's glory here and the love of God's children, all of them. Period. Amen. Our affirmation of faith today, friends, we're responding to the Word of God today with an excerpt from the book of Philippians. So you will need your bulletin insert for this one, for the statement of faith. Philippians 2, 5 through 11. As we express the faith using this bit of scripture, I invite you to join with me in standing. And let us proclaim our faith together. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. You may be seated. Our next hymn, friends, to your Lord and Father of mankind, is hymn number 169.
enter now to our time of shared prayer as we remember our brothers and sisters in faith and the situations, the conditions, the things that have happened to us uh, in these recent days. I do, um, the, the good news, uh, actually, I'm not aware of anybody being in the hospital right now, so that's a pretty good thing. Uh, the farmers are both home. Okay, Lizelle is feeling better, and uh, Margaret is out of quarantine. So how about that? All kinds of good stuff, right? Um, certainly hold in your hearts uh, the other folks on our prayer concern list. Do we need to lift up anybody in particular today? All right, friends, join with me in prayer. Join with me. Uh, from home or across the airwaves, wherever we may be, because the beauty of God's Spirit is uh, the Spirit links us wherever we are right now in this space. Almighty, merciful God, on this day, we give you praise and thanks. We rejoice in the gift of your life and love that enables us to come together to lift up our hearts to you, to recognize here we are a bunch of people each of us with our own problems and challenges, our histories, the things that um, cause us concern and regret. But also, God, we are a people of hope. We know that we come here because you have an answer for us, that you answer us with your love, that you have brought us together here, even though we're not worthy of your love, yet you love us still especially still. As God, this is the way your life and love has worked in showing us honor and dignity as your children, even though we have struggled to be good and faithful children. Truly, it is too great for us to appreciate the fullness of this grace. It is too great for us to truly reconcile with our understanding of the world and the way things work. You care so much for all of us. We ask for that care to continue, especially in the lives of those who are hurting and lonely and sick or diseased, those who are facing starvation and drought, those who are struggling in the face of, of health disasters and crises, for those who are caught in times of great political turmoil for those who don't know where tomorrow may be. We pray for these folks. While we can be here in safety and security and freedom, so many of our brothers and sisters cannot for whatever reason. So God, we pray, extend your heart through ours, extend our heart through yours, Make our sharing of awareness and love here a meaningful and glorifying expression of prayer. We hold in our hearts all of, our all of your children, our brothers and sisters. Make us all more aware of your healing, redeeming, reconciling, saving, preserving, life-changing presence. We pray your goodness for those who are working for a community right here, for the good of this community right here, for blessing Farmville and the surrounding area. We need greater help. We need help for our efforts to deal with the pandemic and those who are struggling in this very moment with that disease. Bless our healthcare providers, our medical workers, bless our frontline people, our first responders, bless our leaders and those who are carrying out the directives of our town. Bless them all in your heart, in your strength, in your mind, in your spirit. Bless them and build them up to continue working and doing good things. We are especially mindful of those who are burning out in this very moment. God, help us to continue to be a better friend, a better neighbor, showing that love. We're grateful for what we've been able to do but help us to continue to be mindful of them for making this a priority. We ask, oh God, that you do show us your goodness in the days to come, that we might 
grow in our awareness of how we're getting along in this world and, and how we as a church need to respond to this world in these changing days and how things can always be better with your help. Help us to find, to seek that help, to work, to bless that help, and to make your heart to grow. We are thankful for this opportunity today and how you are working here throughout us, throughout our lives, between us. We're mindful of all of these things which you've given us to do and the joy we find in your service. We pray all of this in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen and amen. Our offering, friends, is upon us. Let us take seriously and responsibly how we contribute to the goodness of God in these days, how we ex extend God's heart and the goodness that God shares between us and through us. Let us bless our community with our gifts, whatever they may be. As we offer these things to God, join with me in our prayer for the offering in the bulletin. Oh God, love our hearts and the ways we reflect yours. Love our hands and the ways we reflect your work. Love our giving and the ways it reflects your grace. Love your children and how we minister to them in your name. Bless us as your people in this world and give us your spirit that we might be one. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. It is remarkable to me too, given uh, the story I told about Amazing Grace being our final hymn, a hymn that expresses the beauty and joy of being considered loved, even though we don't act like we're worthy of that love sometimes. But God has taken us, broken and sinful as we are, and made us chosen precious in God's sight. We rejoice in this grace. Let us share in the song 649, Amazing Grace. Again, sing with your inner voice as loud as you want.
about the best way we could end this, isn't it? Brothers and sisters, as we go out into the world today, as we go forth to be the light and the salt in this world, uh, blessing our neighbors, our friends, uh, even our enemies. Uh, the, the, the homework for you this week, you know, we talked a little bit about, well, a little bit, a lot about priorities today. And certainly I think that's a worthy conversation reflection piece. I would encourage you to, as you go out today through the rest of the afternoon to think about what priorities you have, what commitments you have, what are your priorities? Maybe how have your priorities changed over the years? And are there priorities that you have today that maybe need to be re-examined? Truly, it is a good thing to know that God is with us and through times of change, and it's not easy, but we are here with our Lord this day and every day, are we not? Absolutely. As we receive the benediction, join with me in standing. May the blessing of God the Father, the, our Lord Jesus Christ, and the grace, the companionship, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abound in your hearts and lives, my friends. And all that we give, do, say, think, or feel, may our lives be a living expression of the grace of God in this way. May the beauty of God work through us in amazing and glorifying ways. And then may this grace overflow to all of those around us, those whom we love and those whom we're called to love this day and every day. Amen and amen.